All right. Well, welcome everybody to the second Sound Bite session with Battery Ventures. My name is Bill Binch. I'm an operating partner here at Battery, and I'll be your host. This is, like I said, our second session. We did our first one a couple of months ago with a superstar CMO out there in the world, Chandar Patabiram, who's the CMO of Coupa. And he dropped some in some killer sound bites indeed, thus the name of the session. The goal of our sessions is for anybody in the audience to walk away from this with some actionable items that they can use inside of their business. So uh, I encourage you to check out our future sessions. I'll tell you about that in a second. But the transcription of our first session is on the Battery Ventures website. This session today, we will have both the audio and the video. So if you hear something, if you miss something, feel free to go check it out again. And um, like I said, we are going to do the third sound bites. This one's going to be in the early February time frame. We're working on the dates. And uh, we're going to have a, a person that uh, is uh, a colleague and a former colleague and friend of, of today's guest. Uh, but our future one in February will be Abe Smith, the nice. international for Zoom. And like I said, a former colleagues of Patrick's. Absolutely. So let's shift gears to today and talk about our current guest, which is another rock star revenue leader from the SaaS world. We have Patrick Moran, who's the former CMO of Calendly, of Quip, of New Relic, to name some of his highlights. Uh, let me give Patrick maybe a quick brief bio on you, and then we'll get going on the session. So Patrick is a Boston boy, where I had the fortune of spending seven years of my life. Uh, he grew up there, attended Emerson College, and uh, before starting and launching his his technology career, he went into the music career. And you can see over his shoulder there a set of drums, uh, along with some video games, some pool tables, some bikes, <laughs> some other different things that you uh, do when you're retired, I guess, which is cool. <laughs> uh, but I'm a music fan too, but uh, I'm a dabbler, whereas uh, I think you entered the business and actually created created uh, value in that being bona fide as a, uh, as a producer and uh, things like that. So cool thing. But Today, we're here to talk about the tech, and you did segue into tech, uh, where you came out like a bullet, joining a company to start your career that was acquired by WebEx, and then stuck around WebEx for a while when it was acquired by Cisco, and continue to grow your career inside of that organization. But you had the bug. You had the bug to do that early stage thing again, and in 2008, eight made the shift back to being a CMO, being an advisor where you're advising and helping some tech startups, where in finally 2010, you joined a relatively young and mostly unheard of company called New Relic, where you led marketing and were a part of that core team that helped them drive up through their IPO. Uh, following that, you made the move over to Quip, yet again, another uh, relatively unknown company that was shortly after that acquired by Salesforce.com. And you stayed on there for several years before going at it once again and joining one of the, I think, main companies that have helped shape PLG Calendar as their chief revenue officer and uh, helped them drive up to, what, a $3 billion valuation. So, Patrick, welcome to the show. Bill, thank you, thank you, thank you. I appreciate it. And thank you for the kind introduction. You'll, you'll notice that I left off all my, my failures and mistakes and everything in between, but you, you got the, the highlights, so thank you. Well, we might double tap into some of those because that's where a lot of the learning happens from, yeah, true. from the failures. But look, for everybody attending today, thank you for joining. Patrick's very, like a lot of people talk about full stack marketers, full stack revenue people. He's got it all. He's got demand gen. He's got the corporate marketing. He's got the product marketing. He's got growth, PLG. He's led sales. He's sold to small business, to big business. So across the spectrum a lot that we have to cover. Uh, I'm going to dive in with a few topics that that he and I prepped on ahead of time. Uh, we've already uh, gotten some pre-questions and then feel free on the chat to start soliciting questions in there because we are going to save, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes at the end to be able to, uh, to ask questions. So Patrick, let's dive in, starting with the career trajectory. Uh, if we plow forward here, you yep. built quite a reputation of picking some amazing companies, some that have IPO'd like New Relic, other ones that have had very successful acquisitions like 
WebEx, like uh, like Quip. I guess you could say it's all downhill from from here. Absolutely. On the career stage, but I am curious about your company choices. You were at New Relic, which had a young uh, a young PLG uh, motion. They were a leader in usage based pricing. You joined Calendly, which also had some of those similarities. I'm just curious, big question for you. Did you deliberately shape your career that way? Or was there some other force at work that led you to go to those companies? Divine intervention. No, I, um, uh, you know, so I have tried to answer this first, which is like finding founders that are doing interesting things that, 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 that are, you can imagine working with because you're in the trenches with them in really deep and important ways. But once you get past that, uh, you know, I go back to, you mentioned WebEx, which I was there-ish, 2002 to 2006 kind of time frame, And what I learned there was like, or, or, and it wasn't obvious to me, but like they were so obsessed with the end user, you know, the, the, the person that's joining the meeting, is it a good experience? Do they, are, are, and, and do they end up creating an account and starting their own meeting? It's like, it's like PLG 15 years earlier, right? And, and so if you take that kernel of end user centricity and you follow that through, when I got to, after Cisco, which by the way, was not end user centric, massively successful company, very customer centric in that they really care about the executives at these large companies and all, all that. But at the end of the day, they, they, they didn't get the WebEx model when they acquired it. It was a really different culture shock. Then, so, so I got to see the opposite of end user centricity and then got back to New Relic and it, it was all about developers. It was, it was the end user. Can we get them using the product in the first three, five minutes of them signing up? And, and so I saw that pattern. Um, when you, met, you, you mentioned Quip briefly. Quip had millions of mobile users before I even joined and I joined before there was even a million dollars in revenue and so 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 everywhere when it was like an obsession around that end user experience first and then Calendly is like the quintessential like give give the end user an amazing experience so I think if I were to like pick out something that's not trite and you know uh do a great job networking and you know all the all the normal things that you would do for a career. I think it's, I think it's being aware of like, man, if, if a company really picks a market and can, can, can focus on that end user experience, then, then I think you have a real shot. And, and in part that works for me because my, I see my job as taking that end user love and, and turning it into revenue and company success over the, over my tenure. I, you know, that just completely went over my head. I, uh, I didn't pick up on the pattern that the companies that you have worked for are ones where you delight the end user first and then maybe go back and sell to the economic buyer yep. or the stakeholder. Um, because I just compare that to like traditional enterprise selling that's out there. I think about that in the sense that you enter and you woo the end user, but you don't always give them access to your software. You get them on your side and then you work your way up to the economic buyer. But I think that's a really interesting object. Well, obviously you, you yeah. did it, but going through WebEx over yeah. to going to New Relic, going to Calendly, these companies where you made it easy and friction or less yeah. friction yeah. for them to be able to use the product. Now, now you look at WebEx into Cisco and then Quip into Salesforce. I would argue Salesforce and Cisco aren't end user centric in the same way that the companies that they acquired, but they know they need to be. And they also know that at their scale, they also have to be tops down as much as they are bottoms up. And so there is a point at which it's nice to be end user centric and all, but you, you have to maximize the revenue opportunity with the, you know, the, the budget owner. Yeah, that makes, that makes total sense. So you saw product market fit in companies that were in That's this end user centric model, and then you pursued those built go to market plans around that. That's exactly right. It's a great pattern match. Great pattern match. Um, outstanding. Well, look, I know a lot of, uh, I know a lot of the people joined probably today want to talk about PLG and get the clinic of uh, Patrick on that topic. But before we get there, I promise we will. Let's talk about some classic sales 
and marketing topics. Let's go to alignment, Patrick. So um, I'll set the table for this. Battery recently hosted a summit called Open Cloud. And at Open Cloud, we had the CMO of Sneak. And he got up and talked about how marketing there is measured on pipeline, that when they go to their board meetings, what marketing presents is what pipeline was created for the quarter. Likewise, the CRO of Snowflake was there and he came and talked about the same thing, that marketing is measured on pipeline, sales team is, is measured on forecast and on close. I'm curious, Patrick, how do you feel about that? Does does that sound like sales and marketing alignment to you? What are your thoughts on, on driving that classic sales and marketing interlock? Yeah, I, I you know, it's it's nice to hear that. It's nice to hear the CMO say um, pipeline, not just leads, right? Because that that's a trap. And I've definitely been in that seat where it's like, all right. I'm going to deliver 2000 leads this quarter and I don't really care about quality. Again, I'm oversimplifying, but like, like that's, that's definitely a trap. Um, you know, I was thinking about it. The, and so two things, one is PLG makes it a little bit more complicated and we'll talk about that later, but around like, all right, who owns the PLG number if, or, if, or self-serve, if that's, if that's how, how that, that falls. Um, but I think, you know, as I was thinking about this challenge, one is the CMO needs to own all pipeline. That's the de that's a distinction I'd make. Um, it's it's not just marketing attributable. If you're going to be chasing attribution when you're trying to grow a business, you're going to be you're going to be hamstrung and and stuck sort of chasing fool's gold, right? You're you're just not it, it, instead of chasing it. Um, instead of building the business, you're focused on, well, wait, I didn't get a return on this banner ad on this network. It's, it's just, it, it, you got to look at it more holistically, especially in this world of like dark social where things are hard to be attributable. That's one on, so that's a clarification on the pipeline thing for sure. Second, I think the CRO ne does need to own forecast to close um, and the, you know, the actual revenue and ARR goal. And I would, I would contend that they have to own the PLG side as well. So if there is a self-serve component, they have to. Uh, I'll extend it to the, and I don't have an answer for this, but the chief product officer, let's say you're a hundred million dollar revenue company, you know, you probably have a CPO. They need to have skin in the game somehow. If, if not uh, compensation wise, they need to have some sort of goal along there in terms of product activation or usage or, or what have you. And then, you know, we've had casual chats, Bill, but like the, the chief customer officer, we've never really talked about like, who owns, raise your hand if you're in, a, in an exec staff meeting and like who owns churn and retention and that NRR number. Um, I would say that the chief customer officer better better raise their hand first. And if, and if the company's not that big yet, then it's gotta be the CRO again, but someone has to own that churn number just as much as, as, as the top line. Um, you know, look, at the end of the day, it's collaborative. Like we all, like you have to have a leadership team that's that's aligned to the revenue goals and and all of that. So I I I know that it's not easy, but my my experience is or the test for me is like raise your it's the raise your hand question. Raise your hand if you who who owns PLG. And if and if this if the product person and the marketer and the salesperson all raise their hand, and maybe that's good, but also maybe it's a sign that that uh there's not clear ownership and goal setting going on. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's a lot to lot to unpack here. So uh, thank you, Patrick, because I think you've filled up this one portion with a bunch of sound bites. So um, a few edgy topics. Let me let me break down a couple here. Um, the CMO owns full pipeline. I think that's a really interesting idea. Now, I I personally agree. I I I think when you're thinking about marketing and sales alignment. Um, I have I have in my role battery the ability to see a lot of board decks, and um, what I've picked up on is a really interesting dynamic. Is sometimes I'll see like a seventy five page deck, and there's twelve or fifteen slides that are for marketing, and I'll go through it. And marketing's talking about a lot of great programs they've run, a lot of great events they've run, you know, different things that they're doing around the the brand. And there's very few or light mention of pipeline. And I always yeah. find that that interesting. So to yeah. your point about owning all pipeline, that that as a salesperson seems obvious to me because yeah. you, you, like, you know, I've had marketers argue with me, well, I don't create all the pipeline. There's partner yeah. marketing. Well, who enabled the partner? Your messaging, 
bed. Yep. And same thing. Like I don't own sales pipelines. Like, yeah, but you know, product marketing is typically a pretty big hand in, in teaching the sales reps how to deliver the message. So anyways, I, I think that's an edgy topic. I actually agree with that. I think it's clean because going back to my board decks, I think it gives the ability for the marketer to come up and have the piece that they own. And here's the, here are the inputs I manage and here's the output and same thing with sales. I, and, and I would add, and I think you did this at Marketo, if I'm not mistaken, um, but maybe it's folklore that like BDRs and SDRs could actually be in the marketing organization, not in the sales organization. I haven't run it that way, but I, I actually believe in that mentality of like, all right, if you're going to create all this demand and you need someone in the middle to convert it and it's an SDR or a BDR type role, marketing should own that function as well, because they're going to do the best job enabling and being intimate with that that customer relationship. Yes. The, the genius of Marketo, our CEO, I think would about every year and a half, two years shift wherever the BDRs were. were okay. um, and I think it was less, I, first of all, I think you have to have a couple of capable leaders. And if you do that, it doesn't really matter that much for its own. But I think he just felt like, I don't want it to get stale. I want to have new alignment. And I, there's a new idea out there that I'll share that I, I've heard a number of companies doing that I wish I had experimented with because I never personally did this when I was operating. But what they're doing is they're having the inbound SDRs report to marketing and the outbound report to sales for alignment. Mm -hmm. yep. And so marketing can't ever say that, you know, sales isn't following up on the leads the right way. No, nope, you won't. So yep. you, you follow up on the, and then sales you know, it's like, look, your SDRs are focused. They're not distracted with doing inbound stuff. That's another team. Your team is just focused on building new pipeline for you. Yep. So, um, yep. so, that's, okay, so that was one, that's Sorry. one great idea. Um, the other one about the, the um, CRO owning everything, including the PLG. I, I, I don't see that in a lot of companies. I see there's typically someone that's like a head of marketing that owns it or a head of growth. Sometimes that growth reports into product. Sometimes it's the marketing. So probably not as common of a model that uh, I've seen out there. I just, I, it, it, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll be honest that um, the reason I, it depends on the culture of the company, but I do know that it, it feels weird to have someone at, even just think about from a pure title perspective, your title is chief revenue officer. And if you only own 40% of the, the, only the sales led revenue, like, are you really living in a, the, like, it, you don't have to live up to a title, but like, it's, it's the mental model of like, who owns the revenue and are, are you going to be better decision maker if you, if you have purview over all of it? The job description though changes a lot, right? You're no longer a driver of sales behavior and, and activity. You're you're the general manager of sorts. So I, I'm not saying it's easy, but like conceptually, one person should uh, one leader should should have oversight over over the levers that lead to revenue. Uh, these are some fascinating ideas. I'll, I'll move us on, but you're yeah, of course you know having skin in the game. I I completely agree. Uh, let's talk one more marketing sales alignment here. Uh, goal setting, Patrick, hmm. you wave the magic wand and we're able to set goals for how sales and marketing cooperate. I'd love to hear some ideas. I know you and I riffed about, you know, New Relic and the path to the first 50 million and some yep. of the thoughts you did there. So love to have you expound upon yeah. that. So touching on that New, new Relic soundbite, it, it was, we were fortunate to be able to focus on one thing in, in largely in marketing and, and sales at the time was sort of at the bottom of this funnel, which was get people to use the product, get them to deploy it, to actually get it into a real piece. It was a monitoring software. So to get people to actually um, see charts and graphs show up in their new, new Relic dashboard. And we knew once they saw data in their dashboard that 11, 12% of them would convert to revenue of some sort. So it was just like, get people to use it, which is PLG in, 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 in spirit and in actuality. Um, and, and again, we could bet on that conversion rate being pretty consistent. Um, man, that was easy. I don't think we'll see like, like, and I think that it should be that easy early days in a company. And I think we were lucky to see that work all the way up to 50. Um, and then there's the, the complexity start, start, starts getting in. But I would say, you know, for me, uh, or 
for me, it's a bottoms up story. You, a, a sales capacity plan, meaning like how many hires, reps are you going to hire? Oh, they can each do $800,000 a year. That translates into X, Y, put them on a, like a little waterfall in a spreadsheet and you're done. I think that's step point one of what needs to be a real plan for your annual plan. You have to do bottoms up conversion rates, active users, um, uh, assumed deal sizes, and if, it, and if the assumption is much different than your reality, then you got to be able to justify it. And, and so I, I, I'm a big believer in the annual planning cycle now. I wasn't. I used to be cynical, like, oh, come on, let's just run our business. But, but the reality is, like, that's where you get into trouble. If, you, if you're not being uh, honest about the growth rate of traffic coming to your website, then, then why do you think it's going to translate into something much bigger later on? Um, so, so it's a bottoms up planning thing and making sure that you're looking at it across everything, not just sales capacity. Got it. Got it. Helpful, helpful, good stuff. Um, let me take in an interesting area here. So um, marketing and sales process and how it's grown. So when I graduated college, the software selling model was inside and outside sales and inside was typically driven on the deal size, not on like a segment or anything like that. And outside was built around the elephant hunters and the right. folks that were out there trying to close the big million dollar perpetual deal cycles. You fast forward today and it's become much more sophisticated. Today, you typically have a segmentation based type of model of small, medium and big. You have geographies, you might have industries overlaid on that. And then you have different models for how you sell. You have direct sales, you have partner sales, and now this newish model in the last 10 years called PLG. Um, I'd love to hear your reflections over those last 10 years as you've seen this grow. Uh, you know, I mean, inside of Cali, you talked about um, a revenue owner owning it. Yeah. Is that the way the model was when you got there? And by the time you yeah. left, it changed. Yeah. You know, some other stories that you've heard about. Yeah, I'll start with maybe a story since we're on a Zoom call. Um, I know this was true up until a year or two ago, and I, I presume it's still true, which is it's back to this title of CRO. The CRO there, again, it's... I. I I, I could be wrong in today's version of Zoom, but but again, leading up through the app, the, the, the pandemic, it was um, the CRO owned the sales number. So anywhere that a piece of revenue was touched with the salesperson and the CMO owned all self-service and, and the business, and we're talking a $4 billion business. That means like $2 billion was self-serve and $2 billion was, was run by, by sales. And, and, Think about that at scale. That is it is probably the biggest example of having two pe two different people own the number. Obviously, Eric, at the C the CEO owns it. At the end of the day, has to report to the street. But but that's like macro example. Um, uh, and then my experience specifically, or or maybe another um, piece. Like I talked to the Figma customer officer recently, and. She said the one metric that they obsess on, which was galvanizing for the company is NRR. So the, the net retention, the net revenue retention, um, AKA the growth of an account, right? And, and their number was astronomical. It was, I haven't seen it in any company that I've been at. I, I, I don't know if it's private or not, but it's certainly over 150% um, year over year um, NRR, which is impressive. And so, um, my point with that, all of that is though, is that um, because of all those dynamics, it's hard. I'll, I'll, I'll note two things. My observation, and I did this wrong at Calendly, I think at the outset, and I think now it's getting fixed largely is instead of our organizing by small, medium, large company size, to me, it's like deal complexity. It's like, high velocity sales, someone just needs a little bit of help. They want to know, does it integrate with Salesforce? Yes, it does. Okay, um, great. Now I'll purchase, but they wouldn't have purchased online. So they needed sales assist. And so that should be lightweight transactions. And then there's lots of customers that really wanted Calendly, but they wanted more traditional sales cycle. They want to do a security review. They want to do all the things that's required. That should be a different type of salesperson. That might be a hundred person company. So it would be an SMB, 
but they need the sophistication of a of a you know a sales cycle or a sales process that that gets them the questions that they need answered. And so, I am a believer in that notion of like I don't know. I, in your world, it's probably corporate sales, and they do like the the inside sales type stuff. And then, but but to me, it's based on deal sophistication rather than company size. I, I think you are probably a red herring on some models to be had. A couple of topics you talked about there that that I could see some things shaping up. Number one is the new model not being small, medium, and large, like you said, but being yeah. there's a self-service, there's a sales assisted, where like right. you said, lightweight, you know, probably pre prefix pricing, prefix delivery, that type of thing, but very simple interactions. And then there's the classic enterprise cycle where someone needs to evaluate, like you said, security and, and check those boxes. In a, and so I, look, so what I'm saying is I think there are some models setting up where you're going to see companies start with that org structure yep. in their business. They're going to start maybe with a PLG motion, start finding people are knocking on their door to have like real-time chat or a live conversation and start servicing them from that sales assisted level. And then that's going to grow them into some bigger accounts and they're going to yep. we need another team that comes and helps. That's right. in that. So I think, I think you're kind of predicting a model there in addition to the NRR comment, because I was on a um, podcast with Tomas Tungus from Redpoint a few months ago, and it all started from this whole concept that Twilio was specifically engineering their land to be low so that they could engineer it to grow, like you said, mm -hmm. in the expansion model and drive incredible NRR because we know that NRR is a, a very high weighting of where companies get their valuation today. Yeah. Um, and I think that's a, a fascinating model of, you know, a company just saying, look, I'm going to come in, I'm going to collect hundreds of dollars a month or maybe low thousands of dollars a month, but then over time build up to tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands and build the business that way. And so do both of the things you just said. Number yeah. one, organize the model of self-service, sales assist, and then enterprise, and then also have this focus that you work your way up through those flows, therefore driving high NRR. As long as the customer experience is great for that, even when they're spending hundreds of dollars, like it would be such a shame to lose them because they didn't see you as the enterprise company that you can be. Right. Because they came in through the a couple hundred dollar a month lens but i love it i i think that's a smart I'll, as long as, like like everything else in wall street though like what a, there's an opportunity for manipulation there right it's like all right i'm going to sign up a customer for a hundred dollars and then magically they're going to be a hundred thousand dollars a year later and i'm going to claim a massively high yeah. nrr but look you're absolutely right but this is what excites me about being connected to the SaaS world right now you know we've talked about it bdrs where do they live and what's yeah. their we talked about when I came out of school, inside and outside. Now we have segment, segmented, you know, kind of corporate mid-market or, or corporate mid-market enterprise sales and what it becomes. So on that great segue, uh, I'll, I'll ask one more question. Then I'll go to some of the other questions that people submitted when they registered. And for anybody listening that does have questions, it's a great time now to start submitting them into the chat bot. But um, staying on the org structure topic there, Patrick, uh, I know that inside of companies with a PLG motion that the supporting organization is super critical, the ops team yes. underneath. You just talked about having an exceptional customer experience at that low end so that you don't lose them as they grow themselves through their, you know, their journey with you as a, as a customer. Yes. What, you know, when you think about ideal customer, or I'm sorry, ideal operating org structures for a PLG company. I know you have some great thoughts around this one. Yeah, I am I am a uh what's the word? A, a, a fanboy of go-to-market ops teams. And and I say that to, in in a bunch of ways. One, I I believe that they are oft what makes the world go round inside a company, right? And 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 when I say that everything, you know, the so, sorry, allow me to unpack that. Go to market team ver ops team versus a revenue team or a sales ops and, and marketing ops and even a product ops thing. In a perfect world, that is one organization, even if there's, there's analysts that are devoted to the individual teams, a central place where data is coming and going and everyone's looking at it the same way. 
I think is super, super critical. Um, and I, I think they're the glue. My, my experience has been, even since WebEx, just because we use that at the beginning of this conversation, the, the, the sales ops and the marketing ops teams at WebEx fundamentally showed us the light on where to go next, right? And connected all the dots between sales, marketing, in this case, PLG, like it's so critical to have all that data being presented by people that are way smarter than, no offense, you and I, that they're just like, hey, look, did you see this trend? And, and you know, this is falling off. No one's following up over here. Like, like the, that visibility by having one team, uh, I think is, is a magic, um, I don't know, is it too dramatic, but an elixir for, for, for success. Um, I've done it both ways. I we did it as a go-to-market ops team, and uh, Kate over at Calendly is running it that way right now. And I think I think it's a magic sauce for for alignment and and uh, you know optimizing the business. So that's my big thing: is ops teams rule the world. They buy the software, and sorry, but they said they buy the software for the company. They implement it. They uh, they pay the bills for or pay paychecks for salespeople. Like they do literally everything that makes the wheels run on a, on a successful SaaS company. So it's amazing. I mean, look at uh, look at at what's happened in the last 30, 40 years. You know, you made it. You made a, a fun remark there about people smarter than you and I. Right. The, yeah. the classic head of sales was a guy or gal coming out of Chico State or San Diego State or Michigan yeah. State, you know, and then the people creating the software have been like Stanford and MIT. Yeah. And, and you're seeing that shift. I mean, like, look at like yep. Mark Roberge from HubSpot, yep. you know, like not a classical sales leadership or sales background, but he brought a tremendous amount of data and yes. yep. to the process. And, uh, I, you know, I have a good friend of mine, John Boucher, who used to work at Oracle. And uh, now he's, I think, part of stage two capital. And, uh, and he said the same thing. He said the future head of sales is a Stanford grad. Yep. I, I agree with that completely. Where, uh, Patrick, where does that report to you? You mentioned with Kate, who's the chief sales officer at Calendly. Uh, you know, I, I remember upon my, my tenure run at Marketo, watching our CEO, the founding CEO, speak at a Saster about 10 things he would do over if he were to do yeah. it over again. Yeah. And one of them was centralize SOPs, MOPs, even CS operations under this go-to-market umbrella. And then, you know, the question went up of where does that report to? And his answer back then was there's some debate based on the strength of the individual, but he said yeah. it's either the CRO or the CFO was the yeah. one the CFO has a horse in every race. What are your thoughts? Like, as you think about modern org structures now with, with these team, these yeah. companies starting with PLG that have a sales assist or a sales motion, and they have these different elements of tech stack and everything like that. Where do you think that reports? I think it's stage, I, sorry to not be definitive, but I think it's a stage of company thing. I think I'll make up the cut line, but like less than 50 or a hundred million dollars in, in run rate, I think it, lives with the CRO. I think a CFO, um, and I'm thinking back to my, my last 15 years, all the CFOs that I've dealt with totally get the power of using data to inform form the business. And, and so, um, and, and, and have empathy towards go to market. I think that's, that's actually the, the, the greater skill is like, they understand that if you were to starve it, or if you were to underinvest or, or, or what have you, that, that bad, th bad things would happen to the company. I will note, the only thing I want to correct on is uh, I, I nodded my head violently to the Stanford comment. I actually don't care what school people went to. And I, I, it, it's just about the intellect and the uh, curiosity and um, business acumen that, that the person has. Um, and I know you weren't specifically saying Stanford, but the, the, it's just, it's so critical to have um, the business acumen part dialed. I, I agree completely. You know, I, I once said this on a podcast where if you go back 15 years, your typical VP of sales entering a company, when it came time to what do you want to know about? Hey, what's your average sale price? Yeah. What's your average sales cycle? What's yep. the new versus existing split? Today, it's a whole different conversation. It's yep. 
you know, break down how you source your business. How much is yep. marketing led? How much is sales led? How much is product led, partner led? You're talking about data. And yep. the amazing thing is it's data that, you know, probably didn't exist or was really hard to get. Yep. Back in some of those days. So I, yep. I think you're right. It's, it's to me, it's it's someone that's got the curiosity and like you said, that sales aptitude, but the ability to come in and look and do analysis and planning around yep. that. And that to me is what one of the key parts of having a great go-to-market ops team is. It's not just turning the crank of running the systems and yep. paying commissions. Those are all outputs, but actually helping you look at and find market opportunities that you might not be seeing by analyzing your data. Yep. And giving it to the leaders to say, what do we want to do with this? And that data informs even the value proposition that you're pitching on the next sales deck. So it's it's it's, it's created. It's it is a full full circle role um, in the future and and now. So totally get it. Totally agree. One hundred percent. All right. Well, Patrick, thanks. Let me shift to some of the questions that were submitted here. And again, for the audience, if you have questions, feel free to put them up in the chat box and we'll try and tackle them. Um, so one of the ones that came in when we sent out the registration link here was when a traditional sales-led company delves into PLG, what are some of the key priorities they should be thinking about? Um, <laughs> yeah. First is making sure that their product is that there's value that get, if, if you take a step back, you define PLG is about getting the interested party, whether it's an end user or buyer to, to get them to value as quickly as possible by getting them in the product, your product model or your, the business that you're in better be able to provide some value by going product first product led. That's not true for every business and that's okay. I, I don't think we have to shoehorn every business into a, you gotta have this like entry point that's product centric. If it makes the most sense to talk to someone up front, then so be it. But so, so that would be my first thing. Um, uh, and then I think, you know, if you're selling to the C-suite um, and it's, it, it, this is, it all comes back to like wanting to be successful. The, the C-suite, the, the chief executive officer isn't going to try your software necessarily. Um, and so you got to be aware of who you're, understand your persona, who you're talking to. That's pretty darn key. And so it, that's the, probably the right level to bubble up to. It's like persona-based marketing and, and um, go-to-market is super critical. If, you, if you're Figma, you want to get that one designer to use the product and to experience it and then and then worry about the rest of the chain. Photoshop didn't, I guess they did have to worry about that, but it wasn't collaborative. So they didn't have the same the same model. So um, those are things that come to mind. The one thing I'll say around PLG too though is like self-cert. And I scratch my head at this, I get lost. Does PLG equal self-serve in everyone's mind? Or does PLG just equal an entry point to value, which can be fulfilled with a salesperson with a click of a pay button online? Like I like the latter. I like the 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 idea that it's just an entry point into a an experience with your company. It doesn't necessarily mean you have to have a shopping cart and be able to buy online. Um I I concur. I, I, I was going to add to this, you know, my experience with this, having worked for a company that was sales led as their primary motion that then adopted a PLG was a couple of things. First of all, a lot of people mistake PLG as SMB or small yes. views. Yes. And, and I think you have to think much bigger than that. Like you said, there's no caps on who can come in. It can yep. be any company. And number, number two, what you talked about earlier is in the, my experience was it took over a year to bring a PLG product to market inside of a sales led company. Everybody goes, why is it so tough? And it's like, look, we had to think through that perfect customer experience yes. that you talked about because the reality is that was not how we were attuned to delivering yep. the product. We yep. sold the traditional model and then we, then we delivered it with, you know, enablement folks. And yep. now none of those were going to be in, involved. We didn't have the ability to shape the experience. So um, there's a tremendous amount of change management that happened yes. in taking a sales-led company into the PLG world. The guy, the person that ran uh, product marketing for me at um, Calendly just posted something about, he said, you know, PLG and all the metrics and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, it's about both teams. If there's a PLG team and just say a sales team, it's about having empathy for each other. 
there's no way I love your answer because there's no way a PLG initiative would succeed within a company without it being nurtured and cared for and understood and championed by an outspoken leader and yeah. um and which it all leads to change management I that is the most important answer so I totally agree so take the question the other way how about if you are a PLG company and you're going to go into sales led, you talked a little bit about this with maybe it's sales assisted first, but That's right. what, what should they consider for a PLG a company that starts with just this friction free model and they want to go into that enterprise or that more high touch selling model? So when I join a company, I, I, and it's not always served me well, but I always try to be sort of a provocateur, like ask or like, make bold statements and strategy sessions or whatever. And like one of my constants that has held fairly true in my experience has been, you will always, with whatever your business model is leading up to a hundred million dollars in ARR, you'll hit a wall. And, and, and that the wall will show up and maybe it's 120, maybe it's 130, whatever it is, but, but you'll hit this wall where the metrics that got you here won't get you there. Um, all to say as it relates to PLG, you may have this like really singing business that's 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 humming along and all the metrics look good and you're cruising past 70 million and run rate and like things are really exciting. But my belief is is that's exactly when, or actually two months or or maybe even a year before that, you should be in starting to invest in in your sales led motion if you're going from PLG to SLG. I think because I think it's it's unless you're Dropbox, unless you have this massive market opportunity measured in millions of paying users. And like, I call it the, the um, what was that? The, the Evernote problem, right? Evernote, man, they were a darling back in 2000, whatever it was, 2008. And it seemed like they were just going to keep going forever. And they hit that hundred million dollar number and, and never and moved too slow. So weren't able to pick up from, from there. And it, it, it's, it's about, TAM, like how big is the market that you're in, but it's also about execution. So all that to say, yes, start with your simple model, self-serve, add sales assist, then go to uh, upselling or aggregating demand or whatever that next phase of selling is. Then there's probably a true outbound and strategic selling motion. I don't know. To me, that's probably a five-year journey. So you got to, you know, this isn't like every quarter you're kicking off a new thing, but like, like you start building that muscle so that year seven or eight, when the company's finally getting to that maturity, you've got, you've got both. I think that's super key. Sage, sage advice. All right, let's go to the question that came in from uh, Mark Patterson, a longtime listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mark asks, you mentioned earlier your emphasis on delighting the end user first before engaging the economic buyer. How do you see PLG slash self service serving a role in that early process. Um, to delay the end user first, yeah. So, so, um, first of all, I think, or again, I came up through the marketing lens, marketing world. So I'm gonna, I, I'm, it's gonna be uh, tainted with this, but I think how you communicate the value of the product in those first few moments, in moments. Uh, most of the places that I've been measured, like the first 14 days are really, really critical. So in the first 14 days, how you communicate, how you engage, how you build a relationship with that end user. And of course, how simple was it for them to go from interest to um, uh, some signal towards habit? Um, uh, when you think about P uh, PLG metrics, one of the ones that I obsessed about and I think good companies do is around habit moments. At Quip, it was like, can we get two people in in two documents at the same, it was a document sharing business. So like, can you get two people collaborating at the same time within the first 14 days? And if you can, then there's a high probability that they'll take off. So you build the motion around that special golden motion moment, right? Um, at Calendly, it was how many meetings get booked in the first X days, 14. Um, and if and if they achieve that number, then magic happens. They they've they they achieved that engagement. And candidly, it doesn't matter if it was the buyer or the end user, like getting them to activate and use that product was the first indicator of a, a massive change in performance down down the funnel. So um 
uh, short answer is know what that magic moment is, understand that metric, and then optimize for it. Keller, Patrick, we are right at time. So thank you for sharing your insights. For everybody that tuned in, as I mentioned, we will be posting this up to the battery, uh, the battery website, battery.com. And Patrick, before you leave, one thing we've started here on the show is for any of our guests, we uh, like you to go away with a fun parting gift. So we have a choice of sunglasses. Nice. Give Ray-Ban Aviators or Ray-Ban Wayfarers. And before you answer, I'll tell you that the team that helped put this together and produce it, we 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 bet beforehand which one you're going to choose. So we have a bet which one you're going to pick. Wayfarers, come on. That's totally what we picked come for on. you. So uh, I'll, I'll get your address in a bit, Patrick, awesome. and get, get a batch of Wayfarers coming out your way. But thank Thanks. you so much for joining and sharing all your insights with me today. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone. Fun conversation. Cool. Take care. Bye.